I'm always too early. Good evening. Good evening and welcome to Bay Tales Live. I'm Vic Watson and somewhere on your screen is Simon Buick. It's not at all going to get confusing tonight because we have the author of The Lost, Simon Beckett, another Simon B joining us, as well as Catherine Steadman and Emily Edwards and Dan Stubbings. How are you, Simon? I'm pretty good. It's been a busy month, hasn't it? Very busy. <laughs> Between Living North Christmas fairs and podcasts and interviews, we're just and everywhere. Canvassing, posters, I'm sure everyone's sick of us. And oh, I am. Nan nano, rhymo, whatever, when you're supposed to do lots of writing in November. Yeah, good luck on that, because I didn't even attempt it. <laughs> <laughs> so, for those of you who haven't been to the show before, um, it's a magazine style format. Uh, Rick and I will start off telling you about a few books that we've been reading recently. Um, then we're going to be joined by, as Vic said, Dan Stubbings, a bookworm blogger who will be our guest in-depth reviewer. We'll leave him to tell you which local author's book he's chosen for review tonight. We'll then be joined by Emily Edwards, who will be reading from a forthcoming novel, The Herd, which, according to Transworld, is a novel about individual choice and social responsibility. Um, again, we'll leave the rest of that to her to tell you about. What's um, next after that, Vic? Well, um, tonight, as I've said, we have Simon Beckett chatting with Catherine Steadman ahead of their, the release of their novels tomorrow. The Lost and the Disappearing Act are both released tomorrow the 25th of November. If you want to chat about us on social media, please use the hashtag BayTalesLive. Um, there was something else I was going to tell you about. And if you'd like to have a chat in the chat box, please feel free. We also have our Q&A. So if you have any questions for any of our um, guests tonight, pop them in the Q&A and I will endeavour to ask them. Um, but yes, if you want to chat with us, please pop in the chat to, I believe it's now everyone we've just discovered today. So. Um, yeah, another another update. Um, and make sure you watch the break, because not only will you hear some great music from our favourite, Jason Isaacs, you'll find out a little bit more about our February event. You'll also have the chance to see a selection of the books that you can win from tonight's show. Um, just as a reminder, we don't ch charge our audience members for our online events. Donations do help us and platform costs and possibly posting off those books to winners. So this is where you can see big names, new authors and share the book love. So, you know, if you want to make a donation, it's always welcome. If you don't, just keep coming back. We'd love to see you. And Vic, what have you been reading? Well, I was going to say poor old Simon needs to heat his house, but I think even if, if you got lots of donations, I guess you wouldn't be able to minute, living on a yeah, building. You may hear the, the, the fan coming on at some point as the, uh, the winter wind blows through. <laughs> So um, I've been reading Black Run by D.L. Marshall. It's the follow-up to the action-packed Anthrax Islands, and it sees John Tyler on a new mission. He has to capture a heavily protected target from the Alps and smuggle him back to the UK just in time for Christmas. We're getting festive already. After boarding a rusting freighter in the dead of night and with the Mark's security team hot on his heels, Tyler's prisoner is found inside a sealed hold on the ship dead who's responsible who will be next you need to read it and find out black run is the perfect follow-up to anthrax island it's breathtaking action combined with an ingenious locked room mystery left my pulse racing um, the car chases are magnificent they're paced to perfection and the humor as always is dark and as sharp as one of tyler's knives it's tightly plotted it's compelling and it's a joy to be in John Tyler's company again. That's Black Run by D.L. Marshall. Right there. It's out, I think, on the 2nd of December, so that's next week. My next pick is Wahala, oh, so close, by Nikki May. Ronka, Simi and Boo are three mixed race friends living in London, straddling British and Nigerian cultures and pushing against the everyday racism they encounter. With the arrival of Isabel, a glamorous but lethal face from the past, more trouble lands at their doors. Wahala is dark, it's subversive, the characters are perfectly drawn and they're not afraid to say what's on their minds. The way in which Nikki May has written this novel is bold, unflinching and absolutely not perfect. I did not want to leave the world at all. Even when things got awkward, I wanted to hang out with Ronka Simeon Boo again. If you missed Nikki's reading on our October show, 
be sure to catch up via our website. It is an absolute must see. She brings the characters even more to life and it was just absolutely joyous to host her. And Simon and I are really looking forward to hosting Nikki at Bay Tales Live in February. There are more details on our website and I believe in the break as well. And the book that I shall be reading next is called Blue Running, yes, by Laurie Ann Stevens. In the New Republic of Texas, guns are compulsory and nothing is forgiven. 14-year-old Blue Bonnet Andrews is on the run across the Republic. An accident with a gun killed her best friend, but everyone in the town of Blessing thinks it was murder. Even her father, the town's drunk deputy, believes Blue Bonnet did it. Now she has no choice but to run. In Texas, murder is punishable by death. This is actually a little bit um, of an unusual read for me because it's, it's technically YA and I don't read a lot of YA, but I am super excited to be reading Blue Running next. Simon, tell us about your reads, please. Okay, so um, last month, um, as well as Nikki, we had um, Amen Along on the show. Um, and if you were at the show, you'll realise what a lovely, sweet, charming man he is. So um, when I got his uh, book, A Good Day to Die, I, I was kind of obviously expecting a cosy crime from him. Wow, uh, it's not. If you're a fan of those books that publishers always like to call high octane, this is one to look out for when it comes out early next year. And it is available on pre-order now, so I, I would advise it. Here's what the blurb says. It's been 10 years since Pretty Boy left the big city. Today's back. No one knows why, but it's clear that revenge is on his mind. He's determined to make the person responsible for his exile from the London scene finally pay. But his plans seem derailed when he takes possession of a bracelet, unaware that its original owner has set a high price for its safe return. Now that happens in the first two chapters, and we're off to the races in a story that never lets up as the body count gets higher and higher. As well as the well-written action scenes, what I really liked was the ambiguity in the book and the slow reveals that kept me turning the pages. We don't know who Pretty Boy is. We don't know what's happened in the past or why he's back. Um, and the book teases us, revealing bit by bit throughout the action scenes. And if you think it's going to be all neatly tied up in a bow at the end, that's not what happens. It has all the makings of a series to come. It is violent and it is sweary, sweary even, but if you're happy with that, this really could be your new action thriller. My second choice of book is a non-fiction title. Um, and it is this one here, The Seven Ages of Death by Dr. Richard Shepard, the follow-up to his number one bestseller, Unnatural Causes, which I read earlier this year. And um, well, enjoyed might not be the right term given the subject. Dr. Shepard is the UK's most prominent forensic pathologist and has been involved with many of the most widely reported criminal investigations of the past 30 years. The second book, which I've just started re reading, is as interesting, compassionate and revealing as the first. It's clearly a, a sensitive subject and it's not done with any um, pantomime drama in there. It's, it's not just about the cases he's worked on, it's the people he's worked with, because the humanity does come through. And he's very honest about the effect that it's had on him. So there's a touch of autobiography. There's some procedural explanation and the human condition are all written about in an extremely readable manner, I would say. Um, so both of those authors will be appearing at Bay Tales Live in February. The third will not, um, and it's a title that's been out for about a month, and I have it here to display because my printer broke just before we came online. Um, the Chaos Kind by Barry Eisler. Now, I love it when authors interweave characters from different series. There's something satisfying and lets you feel really smug when you spot a cameo hidden in a tale from an author whose work you've enjoyed. And I've enjoyed all of Eisler's series, which have been going for years now, starting with John Rain, the ex-government assassin who specialises in accidental murders. There's Docs, the former marine sniper. Marvin Manis, the assassin from The God's Eye View, one of Eisler's previous books. Delilah, an ex-Mozad honey trap specialist. And Leave Alone, the Seattle sex crimes detective with her own personal history of abuse, who's featured in three standalone novels. 
Here, they're all in the mix together, working as a team to try to keep a US assistant attorney alive from overwhelming powers trying to kill her. It's action-packed stuff, um, what used to be called, I think, boy's own adventures. Um, and it seems totally over the top, but with Eisler's level of detail gained from his experience in the CIA's Directorate of Operations, as an international attorney and an executive in a Silicon Valley tech startup, as well as a background in martial arts, it's a bit worrying to think that there's possibly, possibly a lot more real life stuff than we'd uh, like to believe in the books. But wherever you start with the, the Barry Eisler books, um, you can't go wrong. And this is great, bring them all together. So that's my reads. Vic, back to you. Okay, so um, we're going to introduce our guest reviewer of the month now, and that is the fantastic Dan Stubbings. Dan Stubbings is an avid reader of anything crime and SFF related. He's the creator of the Dimensions Between Worlds blog and is currently in the middle of finishing his, the first draft of his second novel. Dan says the first one will never see the light of day and I bet lots of you out there know where he's coming from. So everybody, huge round of applause for Dan Stubbings. Hi everyone, um, thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to be reviewing Deity by the Prince of Darkness, Matt Wedelowski himself. Um, Deity is book five in Matt's six story series. Um, and this is the, the blurb for it at the beginning. A shame pop star, a devastating fire, six witnesses, six stories, which one is true? Um, so for me, if that doesn't draw you in, then I don't think anything will when it comes to to review it for a crime novel. Um, this, is, like I said, it's book five in the, the Six Stories series. So if you haven't read Six Stories before, the great thing about it is all of them are very much standalone tales. So you don't have to read them in any order. I would recommend you do because they are absolutely fabulous. And that's probably one of my favorite authors to be fair. Um, and this one was my favorite one so far by A Country Mile. Um, the, what I loved about it was, with, the great thing about Matt is he's very good at blending, I think, genres. So his crime, he has crime in there, but he's really good at blending myth and folklore and just making you not want to turn the, the lights off in your bedroom. Um, so it's definitely a book I wouldn't recommend that you read on your own because it, you, you won't sleep at night, I don't think, on this one. Um, and the, I love the setting of this one. It, it's centered in an ancient wood in Scotland. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's really creepy because it's about a disgraced pop star who's like a mega star called Zach Christ, Crystal. And he's just passed away due to, ha to the devastating fire at his, his mansion, this creepy mansion that has loads of secrets and allegations going around about him. And nobody's sure whether it was a a suicide or whether it was a planned um, murder and you, you get the you get six different stories from six different people um, with a range of different motives so you've got somebody who's a super fan who is absolutely against all the allegations that are coming out against him that he was you know abusive towards young girls um, that he that he was he was horrible towards his sister, who he was actually part of a duet with. Um, w when he goes later on, um, you have the mother of a, one of the girls that is a, that has accused him, um, and she's getting a lot of abuse, saying you know he sold your child for money, um, and what's going on. You get the point of view from a security guard that was there. Um, you get a point of view from actually a person who is a paedophile hunter, so he has got evidence to prove that they, they trapped him. Um, and then you get a, just the other two a very, very quite dark perspectives of this individual um, that, that to the world was this perfect person. And uh, I just loved how Matt kind of posed the question to the reader of, you know, if, if, because we've all seen it that you know, a favorite celebrity will come out of hours and they'll they'll get accused of some something 
horrible or something that doesn't sit well with us. And you, you kind of think, okay, which kind of side of the fence would you, would you land on? You know, would you absolutely believe his accu their accusers and, and, and completely shun them and not want to be, you know, be with them anymore or read anything or watch anything that they're on? Or would you fall on the other side of, I don't believe what's been said about this person and I'll defend them to the, to the very end. And you get both sides in, in this. And because of the six stories, you get that side of this person that will defend Zach to, to the absolute end. And then you'll get other people that absolutely condemn him and say he was, you know, a horrible human being. Um, but the great thing about Matt is that I love about his writing. You, you kind of, you think you've figured him out. You think you've figured out if, if it's a murder or who's, who's done it or why they've done it. And then you'll read the next chapter or the next page and it'll completely throw a spanner in the works and you'll just go, what? How's that happened? I didn't see that coming. Um, and this one's the best bit about it as well. It just, it just keeps twisting all the time. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think if anyone likes the podcast format, if you enjoy listening to podcasts or reading through podcast um, craft scripts and things like I do, then you'll really enjoy the format that, that Matt's created in his books. Um, the, the dark, the, the, re, the really good social commentary on what's kind of going on in the here and now. Um, you know, this one focuses very much on the Me Too movement and the obviously the Peter Falcon groups that are coming up and things like that. Um, and it was, just, it was just a great read. You know, it's a, it's a very quick book. Uh, it's only 246 pages. Um, 46 pages but every single one is just absolutely brilliant and you're on the edge of your seat and like I say um, don't be reading it in the dark or don't be reading it alone because you won't you won't sleep um, very well but I definitely recommend that you pick it up thank you everyone I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event bye thanks Dan no please after you <laughs> I thought I was doing this bit go for it <laughs> no, go on. Please, after you. I'm a gentleman. <laughs> well, all I'll say is that, you know, you should watch the break and there might be a chance to get a free copy of that book. And the other thing that I will say is um, we are proud to announce the second in our annual, you can say that when there's been one already, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bay Tales <laughs> Christmas Short Story Competition. I want to get a woo for that at least. Woo! down. I'm out so, of practice, huh? I've completely lost it. <laughs> so, following on from our winner, Louise Mangus, last year, one will, winner will be invited to read at our special Christmas Virtual Noir at the Bar Bay Tales crossover show coming next month. The rules? Pretty simple. Give us a seasonal tale with a crime or a mystery twist to it that can be read aloud in under seven minutes and send it to baytales20 at gmail.com by December 12th. You'll see that email um, appearing during the break. Use the same email and just put Christmas story in the subject line. The winner will be judged by our team of published authors and as well as appearing on this show, they will receive a free ticket to our February show or if location makes that impossible for you to attend, which we hope it doesn't. I mean, flights are cheap these days. But if you can't make it, then you will get a very special Christmas hamper of some of our favourite books of the year. Follow us on Twitter at Bay underscore Tales, where we'll be announcing full details over the next day or two. Back to you, Vic. I was going to say, um, you know, I don't think there is anywhere in the world that's too far. We already have somebody joining us in February from Canada. So, you know, if you can't make it in February for a free ticket as well, you're just not trying hard enough. Anyway. And now for our guest reader. After studying at Edinburgh University, Emily Edwards worked for a think tank in New York. Ooh, he started me off now. Before returning to London, where she worked as a support worker for vulnerable women at a large charity. Emily now lives in East Sussex with her endlessly patient husband and her two endlessly energetic sons. 
for which you have my sympathy, Emily. So everybody, huge round of applause for Emily Edwards. Hi everyone, hi. Um, so my name is Emily and I'm really thrilled to be reading to you this evening. My novel, The Herd, follows two best friends, Elizabeth and Bry, polar opposites, whose bond is the stuff of friendship dreams and whose children and husbands are friends too. However, what Brian and Elizabeth don't realize is that their opinions on one very important matter, vaccination, are about to change everything. One little white lie, a lie by omission, and their lives are changed forever. Throwing them into the media spotlight and a court case that will make history. So to start with, I'm going to read to you from the opening scene of the novel, um, and I hope you enjoy it. Farley County Court, December 2019. They arrive in court separately. Bry first, early, perhaps to avoid the worst of the demonstrations outside. She keeps her dark, hollow eyes fixed right ahead of her, her head bowed as if in prayer, Asher's arm around her before she crumples into her seat just in front of the judge's bench. The last time I saw Briar or Elizabeth was months ago at the now infamous party. I remember watching them and feeling, as I always did when it came to those two, a tug of envy, like a great hook in my abdomen pulling. It wasn't what they said or did, quite the opposite in fact. It was the absence of explanation. There was a calmness between them, a knowing, because they were both absolutely confident of the other. Their friendship made them seem untouchable somehow. I've never had that with anyone. It's a few minutes before the doors open again. The whole court shifts, sits more upright, as Elizabeth walks into the large, serious room, Jack a couple of paces behind. Her eyes cast about, scanning to see who's there to support them. She nods at a couple of people. Her gaze lands for just a beat on Brian Ash. Her expression doesn't even flicker before she moves on. Her composure is impressive, silently letting us all know she is blameless, unafraid. She takes her place on the other side of the court to Bry. Her solicitor leans forward to whisper something and Elizabeth nods in agreement, careful not to smile. Next to me, a woman I recognise from the school gate says quietly, it's so sad, so sad, isn't it? She sighs and she finishes whatever she was doing on her phone before dropping it into her coat pocket and turning back to me. I always found their friendship a bit weird, to be honest. I mean, they were so different, weren't they? I nod and wonder whether she feels it too. This sense of something lacking, the hook pulling, that behind all the gossip, all the bullshit chat about school plays and football teams, we are starving for each other, for connection. Is she, like me, desperate to see and truly be seen by another woman? I heard Elizabeth was almost assaulted by one of those anti-vax demonstrators yesterday. Her voice is light, bouncy with glee. Her phone buzzes and she snatches it out of her pocket. I turn back to face the court and I think, no, not her. She doesn't feel it. Now, sitting here, I realise it was stupid of me. Stupid to be jealous of Brian and Elizabeth. Because if this court case is the cost of true friendship, families devastated, lives destroyed, then it can't be worth it. Maybe women like me are the lucky ones after all. Maybe our distance from each other keeps us safe, helps us to hide our wounds, our fears, so we can't be injured by others. Lone wolves making our way as best we can. So that's the first bit, that's the opening. Um, and the next section I'm going to read is from later in the novel, where Ash and Jack, uh, their Brian and Elizabeth's husbands, are on a run together. And they are discussing on this run an email which becomes the catalyst for the court case that follows.
Yeah, so this email, I can't figure out whether it's excessive or not. I mean, I get that she's just trying to look after Clemmy, but saying that Clem can't be friends with unvaccinated kids is a bit extreme, don't you think? It's like we're choosing who our daughter can be friends with based on whether their parents' values align with our own. So the way I see it, Ash keeps his eyes fixed straight ahead as he talks, is that you guys aren't the kind of parents to suffocate Clemmy. Wrap her up in cotton wool, right? You want her to live her life. Which means you're going to have to let her take risks. Letting her go to school, ride a bike, cross the bloody road. There's risk in everything. Probably more risk in all those things than there is of her contracting polio or whatever. So I suppose you have to figure out how great the risk is that Clemmy could catch one of these, you know, viruses. And if she did catch something, how great is the risk that it could really make her sick? I mean, when was the last time you heard of someone we know getting TB? Honestly, I think the risk is pretty marginal, mate. I really do. Jack doesn't know what to say. He wasn't expecting this. He thought Ash, with his left-wing community-centred politics and his subscription to new scientists, would be waving the flag as hard as he could for vaccines. But then, for Ash, this is all theory. And of course, Ash hadn't been around six years ago when Clemmy had been really sick. When Jack would come home from work and Elizabeth would be shaking and wild-eyed. Those terrible nights when he'd wake to find Elizabeth sobbing, clutching Clemmy fast asleep in her arms. Bri had been worried about her friend. I tried to talk to Jack about it, but he'd reassured her. Of course Elizabeth felt overwhelmed from time to time. She had two energetic young boys and a tiny baby. Who wouldn't feel like they couldn't cope occasionally? Brian Ash had only just started dating when Clemmy was ill, so Ash hadn't seen their toughest time. Ash didn't know the horror of watching his tiny little girl turn blue and struggle to breathe. He wasn't there when Elizabeth didn't sleep for two weeks, terrified that if she closed her eyes for a moment, her baby would fit to death. He didn't have to pick her up from the kitchen floor. He wasn't there for the trips to A&E. He didn't know that the fear had sent them to therapy. Clemmy with them even then, cooing in her car seat under Elizabeth's constant watchful eye. Ash didn't know how it felt not to be trusted by your wife to look after your own child. Ash slows as they approach the gate that will take them onto Neville Road, which leads in one direction to the cemetery, then into town, and in the other, home to Saints Road. So what I think you should do, mate, is say that you don't mind sending an email, but perhaps word it differently. So it's like, as you know, Clemmy isn't vaccinated, blah, blah. So we'd appreciate it if your child has any signs of an infection or illness to give this one party a miss, or something like that. Jack bridles. It's not that she isn't vaccinated, mate. It's that she can't be vaccinated. Okay, sorry, but it's basically the same thing, right? Jack hangs back, letting Ash go through the gate first. It's fucking not the same thing. Not at all, he thinks. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Good idea, mate. Thanks. Ash smiles. Pleased he solved another of his friend's problems. And he starts to run, sprightly now, towards home. Jack hangs back, wishing he'd never started talking about the email, wishing he'd left it alone. His mood is heavy, lead throughout his body. It's not until he's home and in the shower that Jack replays the conversation and realises that it isn't what Ash said exactly that troubles him. It's that he had everything so well rehearsed, almost as if he was anticipating this chat, as if it had been weighing on his mind as well. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that reading. I really enjoyed reading to you all. So thank you for having me. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us, Emily. Not at all. Best of luck next year with it. Thank you. See ya. <laughs> okay, so we are going to go to our break now. Um, I'm going to pop in the chat a donation link, should you feel so inclined to donate to us, but there's absolutely zero pressure. I know things are tough, particularly at this time of year. So please don't um, stress if you can't donate. Um, so we're going to go to a break. 
you have until midnight tonight, UK time, um, to email us if you would like to win a book. It does say in the slides to only pick one book. So you might want to wait to hear from our guests, Simon Beckett and Catherine Steadman, before you decide which of the books you would like to, to win this evening. So we will see you in about five minutes. <laughs> oh, I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old times, they are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away. Dixieland, where I was born. Early Lord, one frosty morn. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Welcome back. Okay, good luck trying to decide which one of those you want to enter a competition for. They're all fantastic. Right, now for our main event. Let me introduce our guests this evening. Catherine Steadman is an actress and author based in London. She's appeared in leading roles on British and American TV, as well as on stage in the West End, where she was nominated for a Laurence Olivier Award. Ooh. Catherine's first novel, Something in the Water, was a number one New York Times bestseller with rights sold in over hmm, 30, count them, 30 territories, as well as being a Richard and Judy book club pick 
film rights have also been sold to Reese Witherspoon's production company, Hello Sunshine. That deserves another woo! <laughs> Catherine's third novel, The Disappearing Act, is released in paperback tomorrow. Catherine, welcome! Hi, hiya! I will just introduce... Um, introduce you our next guest and that is Simon Beckett the number one international best-selling author of the David Hunter series his books have been translated into 29 languages Ooh, appeared in the Sunday Times top 10 bestseller list and sold over 10 million copies worldwide wow the former freelance journalist found inspiration for the first David Hunter novel after a visit to the world-renowned Body Farm in Tennessee, which introduced him to the work of forensic anthropologists, as well as co-winning the whip, the Whipper, the Ripper Award. That would be what it was sounded like if it was Jonathan Ross, I guess. The Ripper Award in 2018-19, the largest European crime prize. Simons also won the Raymond Chandler Society's Marlowe Award and has been shortlisted for the CWA Gold Dagger, Dagger in the Library, and the Thixon's Crime Novel of the Year. In addition to the six David Hunter titles, the most recent of which is The Scent of Death, he's written five standalone novels, one of which, Where There's Smoke, was adapted into a major ITV two-parter. The Lost is out tomorrow. So welcome, Simon and Catherine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us both of yeah, both of you. Dear me. I'll, I'll get it together eventually, just in time for the show to end. Catherine, can you tell us about the Disappearing Act, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is the paperback cover, which is slightly different to um, the hardback cover. Um, it is... Um, I have two jobs. So I'm an actress, um, as you're saying, and, and an author. So this is the first book where I've actually used my background in acting um, to um, any kind of authorial effect. So um, what I've done is I've set it during pilot season, which I don't know if um, uh, the attendees will know what that is. Like it's, um, it's, it's a, a season between sort of late January to February uh, to April in Hollywood, where actors from all over the world um, migrate to Hollywood um, and audition for all the TV series that are being made that year. So everything that you see on television is cast at that time of year. So if you don't get a part then, then you're not going to be a lead in a television show, at least in America. So it's a very sort of, it's a very competitive atmosphere. Um, and it, it's, it's pretty fraught and you've got a lot of actors, a lot of people who are newbies, young and excited and a lot of old hands who are sort of getting to that sort of last chance saloon sort of area. So it's kind of rife with thriller aspects in that sense. And uh, yeah, The Dispering Act is about a, a young actress who's just sort of made a name for herself as Jane Eyre on a British um, television channel. And she's gone over to try her luck in Hollywood. Uh, a general casting, she meets a girl um, who she isn't sure if she's gone missing or not, but she can't get, she can't get the idea that she has out of her head. Um, and it's one of those situations where ca at castings, everybody looks incredibly similar. Um, it's, it's the reason you've been sort of called to the audition. So it's very, very hard to work out if the person is missing or isn't missing. So yeah, from that, everything unravels and yeah, it gets very tense. Great, thank you so much for that. Simon, um, six books in the David Hunter series, acclaim, millions of copies sold. Why did you decide to start working with new characters? Uh, um, sometimes it's, it's good to take a break, really. Um, nothing uh, more sinister than that. I still enjoy writing about David Hunter um, and I, I will do again. But uh, David Hunter is a, is a specific type of character. He's a forensic anthropologist. Uh, he's quite an insular type. Um, so there's certain situations that he wouldn't sit comfortably in, if you like, which mm. means there are certain situations I can't really place him in as a, as a writer. So I wanted to, to write a different sort of story, really, with a different sort of character and uh, somebody who, um, who wasn't like David Hunter in, in a lot of respects, um, which would allow me to, you know, Go to different places with him really. Excellent, so can you give us a little idea about what we can expect from The Lost please? 
Yeah, the, the main character is Jonah Colley, who's a Metropolitan Police Firearms Officer, um, and he's contacted one night while he's off duty by someone he's not heard from in um, a number of years. And uh, they, they sound pretty desperate, uh, ask for his help and want him to go out to a, an abandoned warehouse uh, at a place called Slaughter Key, which really should have been enough to, to put him off. But uh, Jonah being the sort of person he is, he's reluctant, he doesn't really want to go, but he feels he's got to go and, you know, because this was somebody who was a friend, he's got to go and find out what, what happened, what, you know, what's going on. Um, and when he gets there, what he finds is, is pretty horrific, um, without going into details. It's, uh, it's a really unpleasant, scary crime scene. Um, Joan is attacked, um, he's badly injured. Um, and that really not only changes the, the course of the novel, but the course of, of his entire life. Because 10 years prior to this, his, his own life changed because um, he had a, a personal tragedy when his young son disappeared. Um, and as the events in the, the novel play out, Jonah begins to suspect that maybe everything he believed that happened 10 years ago might not be true and that what's happening to him in the moment could in some, some way be connected to what happened right then. Excellent. Now, you mentioned Slaughter Key. Um, how important is, is setting to you generally in your, in your novels? Yeah, it's, it's really important. Um, I mean, it does sound a cliche saying that, that you know, the settings, the locations are almost like a character, but to my mind, that they are. Um, I find it hard to um, get into a story until I, I can actually visualise where it's going to be set. Um, and I enjoy writing about, you know, atmosphere and um, bouncing characters' moves and what's going on, you know, around them in the environment. Um, and, I, yeah, and so, I mean, from a, a crime writing perspective, then you know, there is something about old empty buildings. I think that's a trigger a lot of... Uh, keys for a lot of people um, so it, it for me it's really important and I do you know I put a lot of thought into it and try and get the, the mood and atmosphere right. Yeah and it was really evocative and in those opening scenes at Slaughter Key so that was great. Catherine your books have featured some lovely locations Bora Bora, LA and Norfolk what do they lend to your stories do you think? Um, well the same as Simon I would say that it's it's one of the key sort of aspects when I start the idea for a story um location because I like all of my books to be escapist I don't I don't sort of want to waste um a reader's time with something that isn't what they could get at home um and whilst you know thrillers are always you know relationship based it's it's always fun to sort of throw an extra situation or circumstance into things and and my locations are always an additional circumstance um you know she um in 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 my latest book the disappearing act she's in la for a reason la is you know where um people become stars and and where dreams are shattered and so as well as contending with everything that's going on in her life and everyone around her's lives there's that sort of underlying atmospheric tug for the character of why she's there um, the same with um, something in the water. There's this, there's this kind of aspirational sense when you're on holiday that anything is possible. You could be a different person. You can achieve different things. The world suddenly opens up for you because you're in a different place. And yeah, I, I like to sort of um, the book I'm writing at the moment is set in New York, and I like everything to be very clearly tied to location and what it sort of brings out of people. Um, their motivations and things like that so yeah it's pretty central yeah great um just for our audience members just a quick reminder there is the q a facility on your screen somewhere usually at the bottom but perhaps somewhere in the top corner under more so if you do have any questions for simon or catherine please do drop them in michelle houlihan who is watching us all the way from canada has got in there pretty quick um and would like to know catherine um the opening paragraph for Something in the Water was brilliant. How did it come to you? Um, yeah, I um, I just started writing it. I, I had the idea for the central hook of the book that um, a couple um, a couple finds something in the water on their holiday that changes their lives. Um, but I wanted to start it at a real trigger point of the story um, so that the reader has to know like a puzzle 
like they want to know, but also they want to work out themselves and there's enough room for them to work out for themselves what, how it's going to end the way it does. And um, so I'm not going to spoil the story by saying that the first um, paragraph is the central character, Aaron, digging a grave. And it's a very sort of darkly comic, um, this is coming from me, <laughs> um, darkly comic kind of logistical analysis of what it actually takes to dig a grave. Um, and in terms of where the inspiration came from, in my sort of, my other job as an actor, um, I did an independent film in Luxembourg with um, Ollie Alexander, who has now turned out to be the lead singer of Years and Years. Um, we were playing twins and um, the director was quite, um, what's the word, method, quite method. And um, he dropped me and Ollie in the woods in Luxembourg with a shovel and a pickaxe and um, told us to uh, dig a grave because there is a scene in the film where we're halfway through digging a grave. And he was like, people don't understand <laughs> how hard it is. So anyway, he left us in the woods for six hours. And um, uh, yeah, and we managed to get, I think like three foot down. I'm gonna say I did most of the grunt work. Ollie is, Ollie is not the muscliest man. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and I just thought, God, I, I just, when you watch the gangster films, I, I can't remember the last thing, I think it was The Irishman I was watching with Scorsese and I was like, how did he dig that so quickly? How did he, he's not even sweating. It would have taken him like, I don't know, very long time. But yeah, so that's where the inspiration came for that. Wow, that is um, terrifying. <laughs> and Simon, we're expecting or I'm expecting certainly Jonah to be a recurring character. How do you keep a series fresh over the course of several books? Um, sometimes with difficulty, I think. Uh, for me, with the, um, the David Hunter series, um, almost by accident, I, because he is a forensic anthropologist, and when it came to writing the second novel, I decided I wanted to do a completely different cast of characters, different setting, and everything. Um, because um, his job means that he, get, he, he needs to travel around to where the crimes are, which can mean all over the country, uh, different countries sometimes. So in a way that was, um, it wasn't planned because of that, but it did mean that by setting each novel in a different location uh, with, uh, you know, completely new, new people around him, um, he's a stranger in a, in a strange land every, every time, if you like. And that helped me bring something um, I think a little bit, you know, different to each one of the books, which I hope freshened them up and made, you know, made them distinct from each other. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll see how it goes with, with Jonah. I'll, uh, I'll sort of link one book in with that one. But uh, yeah, you do need to, to shake it up because, I mean, it's got to be, the series has, has got to be enough familiar elements for people to want to come back, but you don't want to be reading the same thing time and time again. So there's got to be enough there to keep, you know, readers on the toes and not quite sure what's going to be happening. Yeah, and um, how do you manage to keep track of, of your characters' backstories as, as you build up this body of work? Um, I, 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 sometimes you have to write things down, um, pace around, having, you know, thinking things through. But uh, in general, I, I don't really have much, much difficulty with that. It's, uh, I, I can you know, tend to be able to keep things in my mind because it's, yeah. as you're writing them, they actually become characters to you. I suppose so you do keep their, their stories so it's not usually a case of sometimes you've got to go back and check things just to make sure but uh, generally I, I think with some of the main characters I, I can keep things reasonably straight. So Great. Great. Um, Susan at the book trail would like to ask you both a question. She says um, which location would you love to visit so you can get it into your next book? Catherine. <laughs> oh, that's very really hard. Um, I found out from my accountant after uh, after um something the water came out that i could have done an expense all expenses paid trip there and it would have been fine with the tax man but not after the fact <laughs> oh, no. so, yeah i think um if i uh if i could do it all again then i would do that <laughs> i would go to bora bora um and not have done the weeks and weeks of youtube video footage of every single hotel without ever going there <laughs> um, I would do that. I don't know, but I don't know. Uh, somewhere, somewhere strange and exciting that um, I haven't thought to go before, I think. Excellent. Simon? 
Um, I don't know really because uh, most locations in my mind books aren't necessarily places you'd want to go, <laughs> go to. Um, the actual largest settings are quite, you know, are very scenic, but, um, but most of them tend to be UK sets and I, I do quite enjoy doing that. So maybe I do need to set somewhere, somewhat, you know, one of them somewhere nice and exotic and uh, I'm thinking about doing that. But uh, at the moment, I've, I've, you know, I tend to be, the, the, you know, very sort of closer to home really. Great. Um, for the people in the audience who are watching, could you tell us a little bit more about the body farm in Tennessee, please? Yeah, it, well, I, I went there and I, was a, I used to be a, um, a freelance journalist and um, I'd heard about this remarkable place where I used um, real human bodies, real human cadavers to research decomposition. Uh, and back then it was the only place in the world that did this. And I managed to get a commission to go over there while um, police officers, US police officers were doing intensive crime scene training. So um, they don't let many people in, so I was quite, quite privileged to do it and, and mm. very nervous as well because I've, I've not seen you know, this sort of thing before. And basically they will um, let bodies decompose under different control conditions or, or just lay them out in the wild sometimes and observe what happens and record it. So it's, it's a way of, of finding out what happens in the natural process uh, and then, you know, so then it becomes uh, knowledge that can be used in criminal investigations or, or whatever. Um, so it's, it's a remarkable place. There are more body farms now and the, you know, there's more than that have cropped up, but that was the, the first one. And uh, it was, yeah, uh, it was a remarkable place to visit. That's terrifying. And I look, Again, a bit like Slaughter Key, it's just such an evocative name, the body farm. It's just perfect. Um, our very own Simon B, Simon Buick, would, would like to say, both your novels come across as very filmable. What are your favourite crime slash mystery movies and have any influenced your work? Simon, you look deep in thought there. Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, for me, one of the, I think, high water ones would still be Simon and Lambs. Um, which, uh, and I still think it, it, it keeps up to repeated, you know, viewings as well. Um, mm. I think the, everything about that was just, you know, tremendous. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's some rug pulls in it as well, which where you think you're watching one thing, again, I'm not going to spoil it, I'm sure most people have, have seen it by now, but you mm. think you're watching one thing at the end, a door opens and you realise you're watching something completely different. It just turns it all on its head. Yeah. I love that sort of thing. If I can do anything like that in a, in a book, then I will be, you know, I will be happy. I'll be a happy, <laughs> happy writer. Um, so, yeah, for me, I think Silent City Lambs is, um, you know, still one of the, uh, the biggies. Great. And Catherine? Um, I think, like, um, I think probably quite anth anthology-based stuff, like... Um, Hitchcock has that quality his films are quite short and they take one very distinct sort of central hook like you know the rope or, or vertigo they take one very clear um, hook and they just run with it in a kind of what if scenario I think things like like yeah those those sort of Hitchcocks the less narrative Hitchcocks in the sense that they're that they're more about plot and character flaw than telling a kind of romance or anything like that. Um, also more modern things like Black Mirror, um, mm. you know, these sort of like Twilight Zone-esque sort of shows that, that they, t they take sort of little ideas and just sort of twist them slightly. Um, yeah, those sorts of things. That's great, thank you. Um, and another question from Simon, and I think he's just shown off here. He says it's NaNoWriMo month, which, you know, some of us aren't doing but Simon is. Um, he says lots of authors are out there trying to write their books in a month. How long does it take you typically to write a book? He says it might either encourage or scare the writers out there. <laughs> Simon? <laughs> well, I think the, the only answer I can say is too long. Um, I, 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 I would love to, to write a book a year, um, but I, I don't know if able to manage it. It just seems to take me uh, a long time to put the ideas together and then get the plot working with the characters and all the rest of it so it can generally about 18 months i'm afraid so i'm not the fastest writer and catherine um well it sort of breaks down because um 
I'd say for like the first draft, I'm a kind of writer who just sits down and does sort of like 12 hour days and sort of um, bashes it out. When I've got an idea, I'll, I'll bash the first draft out um, and see where it goes. So that's usually like two to three months for that. Um, and then obviously, I mean, it works out to a year because you're doing edits and, you know, structural edits, copy edits, line edits. And yeah, so it always works out to a year, which is kind of good because um, otherwise I would be not on my deadline. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the, the first burst of creativity um, is kind of torturous, but relatively short. Yeah. So coming off the back of that, um, do either or both of you or neither of you plot do you do research before you start while you're doing it I know one writer who has um she just leaves gaps in her manuscript where she's like insert uh, I don't know medical condition here insert name of band here so that she doesn't sort of interrupt the flow so to speak so um is that kind of how you work or not Catherine um yeah I um it depends really um so if I'm writing, like, um, for example, my first book, um, I'll get, I'll, um, I'll have sort of tent poles of the story that I know um, by the third chapter I need to get here, I need to cover this, this, this. Um, but I like to give it space to go in whichever direction where, and that's where the research sort of comes in and really helps because if I find out, for, exa for example, like the flight paths over a certain area do something weird, then that can become a whole other section of the story so sometimes it's really worthwhile in that first burst to like go on a deep dive on the internet and um, find out some weird interesting information. And Simon? Yeah I think um, I most of the books that tend to tend to follow a different pattern to be honest okay. I mean I'm still trying to work out exactly my best method of writing because it seems to change from time to time you know from each time I start but I, I do plan as much as I can, but I've come to realize that uh, it doesn't matter how carefully I plan sometimes. There was one book in particular, I thought I've, I've nailed this. Before I sit down to start, I know where I'm, exactly where I'm going with this. And it, it didn't last beyond the first few chapters. I think, um, and I've, I've been hearing other people that come across the, the same sort of thing, about 25, 30,000 words in, as you sort of hit a point where you think, hang on a minute, I'm not sure which way this is going now. So I've, I, I tend to plan as much as I can. Um, a few, if you like, stepping stones. You know, I like I like to know more or less where I'm heading, but then mm. within that, I realise it's going to change. Um, so I, again, I try and push on and get the first draft done. But sometimes, if there's a, a real plot change that you think you know I can't really write, carry on writing until I've gone back and fixed that, then you will have to go back and mess yeah. with it a little bit more. So it's, a, it's a, there's a lot of chopping and changing for me. So does that mean you, you always know the ending before you write it? I've got a rough idea um, and I generally have a, you know, a, a visualisation of, of where it's going to be, what's going to be happening. I don't always know exactly why <laughs> or what's going to be going off in there, and the mechanics of it. Um, but I've got a, a rough idea of the, you know, the, the direction of progress, shall we say. Great. And Catherine, do you know where you're going? Before um, you're going? I usually have have about three different endings in my head um, and then by the time I get to the end one of them will always seem like the most interesting or rewarding um, having finally got there so um, yeah I'll have yeah a couple of ideas but even I don't know until I get towards the end which is wow. going to be. That's really interesting it's almost like a choose your own adventure. Um, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um, Simon Keith Young in our audience would like to know did the body form not prey on your mind? It, it did, but not in, in the way you might expect. Um, I was really nervous going in there um, because, as I mentioned earlier, I'd, I'd not seen anything like that before. Um, and the, the police officers who were there were very nervous as well because even though they, you know, they see some things when, you know, during the course of the job, it was a new, new territory for them as well. Um, but what I found was that once you got in, into the place, you know, behind the gates, um, it's a scientific research establishment, the scientists there, everything was very professional. It was like nothing else had ever seen, but it, it was there for a purpose. It wasn't as if it was, um, you know, um, a shock horror type thing. It was there for a purpose. And um, they, one thing they did spell out before they let anybody in, let anybody in, was that 
although the people inside would, would, would be dead, we would see dead people, they were still individuals and needed to be respected. And that was something that always really stayed with me and I tried to, you know, keep that in the, you know, in the novels as well. Yeah. Um, and it was, it's surprising how quickly you adapt. Um, and I think by the afternoon of the first day, you got over that feeling, that surreal sense of, am I really seeing all this? And it became a, a, place, of, a place of work. I mean, I was there as a journalist, I was there to work police officers obviously were and the scientists were as well so very quickly everybody keyed into that you know yeah you, you know, you've got to be professional here and uh, be serious about it so yeah it, and it, it seems strange coming back but as you know my overriding feeling is that I felt privileged to have been let in there. That's really interesting um here at Bay Tales we're running our second short story competition do you guys write many shorts or do you stick to novels or have you written in any other form at all? Um, Catherine? Um, I'm actually, I'm writing my first short story at the moment um, for Amazon. Amazon are doing like an anthology. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm right. I'm doing that at the moment. Um, I've just finished my first draft. It's my first draft, not the official first draft. So I'm like, mm, I'm about 2000 words over the word limit. So I'm like, this is why I'm a novel writer. <laughs> but um, yeah, I love the format. So I'm excited to sort of like um, hone, it, hone it down. Um, but in terms of like other medium, I'm, um, I'm currently writing a TV series um, for uh, Paramount Plus, um, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, I think that's being filmed next year. So that's like a whole different sort of format, although it does kind of go back to my other job and um, that sort of area of things but yeah it's it's all it's all kind of the same there's slightly different rules but it's it's all the same kettle of fish really yeah and Simon how about you? Um, I do short stories occasionally um, I tend to find that when uh, I'm in the middle of a novel I don't want to break off doing something else although sometimes you know it, taking a break is, is no bad thing provided mm. you don't spend too long on it so yeah, I've done a few David Hunter short stories and a few, um, if you like, standalone short stories. But uh, and I think it's, it's it is a for me it's, it's quite a different thing because it's such a, a tighter constrained medium because it's so shorter, so uh, it doesn't have the um, uh, the spare, if you like, spare mm -hmm. wordage that you can you know find in novels. So you've got to be you know quite precise doing it. Yeah. Um Stephen Rogers has got what I think is a brilliant question. Um, he says, it sounds a strange question, but do you enjoy writing or do you have work, bad work days like the rest of us? Uh, um, I, I enjoy writing, but yes, I certainly have bad work days. <laughs> I don't think it matters what you do. I'm sure everybody's going to have a bad work day. But uh, yeah, I do feel fortunate to be doing what, what I am doing. And uh, when it's going well, it's, it's great. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, everyone does. Um, you have the days when you think you've written the best thing in the world um, and it's just, you know, a glittering diamond masterpiece. And then you'll read the same thing the next day and think, mm, yeah, I don't know, was I drunk? I don't know. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I, I think it's just about, I think, especially when you're doing a first draft, it's just about sort of getting over yourself slightly and letting yourself write something terrible because no but like i said like nobody is going to see your first draft they're only going to see the first draft so um yeah as, as, as long as you've got like a base coat you can put whatever you want over the top of it um so yeah bad days but you need bad days to get good days yeah and um, paul short would like to know other than the internet what else do you both use for research especially when dealing with something specialized um for me um my second book mr nobody was um it's uh the, the lead character is um uh a neuro uh, psychiatrist so um i needed to obviously get someone who has that specialism um to look over all of the medical um facts and, and everything in the story i watched a lot of documentaries um yeah youtube is maybe not every writer's best friend, but certainly my best friend. You can find 
I don't know, you can find explanations for how to do anything. You can you can make a bomb if you want to make a bomb. <laughs> no. um, you know, you can, th there's like very strange videos out there. But um, so, yeah, I, either I'll watch experts talking about it in documentaries or on YouTube, or I will contact like an expert directly um, and run questions by them. Yeah. Great. And Simon? Yeah, I mean, for the, certainly for the documentary series, I've got some textbooks, you know, forensic textbooks and things, which are always good for a resource. But the main thing, again, is getting in touch with people who know. Um, and I think that, is, you know, there's, there's no substitute for talking to somebody who actually does this sort of thing for a living, whether it's a you know, forensic expert or a police officer or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, you, you track somebody down. Um, I mean, I do know, you know, quite a few people now who... Willing, uh, willing to help, which is great, um, and just ask questions and see if they won't mind sparing you a few minutes to uh, to help you out. And most pe most people are, are very generous with it. Yeah. And did you find that you were at an advantage because of your journalism background with that? Then. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that helped because obviously, when a journalist, I'm certainly talking from my perspective, you've got to sound as, as if you know what you're talking about, even if it's a completely new subject. Yeah. So. Um, and so there's that aspect, but also just, you know, knowing that um, you, you need to talk to somebody who actually know, knows what they're, they're on about and more than you do. And not being frightened to actually get on the phone or send emails and approach people and just explain and all the rest of it. So because it's obviously it's, you know, part and parcel of being a journalist and it, it's useful to, to know some of that sort of stuff as well for writing the novels. Um, Simon. Buick and I have been running um, Bay Tales and before that virtual noir at the bar since March 2020. And previously I wouldn't really have asked this question because everybody's routine was a bit of a mess given lockdown and so on. But I would just like to know um, how you guys write. So um, do you have a set time of day that you write? Do you have a set place that you go to? Do you use a pen and paper? Do you use Scrivener? How does it look like for you every day or whenever you choose to write? Catherine? Um, yeah, I, uh, it really depends how close my deadline is getting. I'm very much a person who is a stick rather than carrot. Um, I, need, <laughs> I, I set my own deadlines way ahead of when they are. And then I tell my agent and I tell my publisher, <laughs> I'm going to get it to you by the end of the month. And they're like, you don't have to do that. I'm like, I'm doing that. <laughs> That's what's happening. So, um, and then I just sort of get up in the morning and um, yeah, um, take my daughter to nursery and then just write and then have lunch and then write and then go pick my daughter up and have dinner <laughs> and then <write laughs> until it's done. And then, yeah, um, that's, yeah, that's sort of my schedule. Yeah. When I'm, when I'm working on something. Yeah. So you're fueled by panic mainly. Um, no, just like time limits. I like structure. Um, which is odd for someone who is a writer and an actor, but mm. I do really like structure. Excellent. Simon? Um, I, I try and treat it uh, like a, a, a day job, an office job, if you like, so I keep office hours, and it never works. Because <laughs> I tend to find, you know, so I like to be, I've, I've got an office, and I like to be at my desk for, you know, nine-ish or so in the morning, and, you know, theoretically work till five or six or something like that. But what, what tends to happen is that um, as you start, when, I, when I'm the early stages of a novel, uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot for me of, of, of um, throwing ideas around and planning all the rest of it. Um, as, it as it progresses, I will then be more nailed to the desk, basically. So by the end of it, the last few, few months, um, again, it's, it's long days, you know, no time off and all the rest of it, just trying to actually get it finished. <laughs> so you're not too far past the deadline at the very least. So uh, I, I'm not particularly structured with any of it, I'm afraid, but uh, I wish it was. But uh, it's, I think it, you know, it's, it's how we, what works for you and uh, for better or worse, that seems to be uh, what, I, what I do. Absolutely, thank you. Um... I've got a couple more questions for you and then unless we get any more from the audience you're free to go and enjoy your evening um obviously simon you've written a lot of novels catherine you've written three so i think that's a, a pretty good number to ask this question question of what do you think you've learned as you've progressed through writing your novels simon um 
trying to stay relaxed. I have had, I mean, what is called writer's block, but whatever it is, I've experienced difficulty writing um, uh, at certain points, and it is then easy to, to, to panic about it. Um, and that, that never helps. So I think as, a, as, I've, you know, as I've gone on, I, I, you know, I am more relaxed about it now. Um, and you think, yeah, I've been here before, I'll sort this out, you know, it might seem an insoluble problem, but I'll get there. And there's different ways of approaching it. But I think the key to it is, is just trying to be relaxed about it and enjoy it. I mean, this is a question that came in earlier. I mean, there's no point doing this if you're not enjoying it, because I don't know if the reader is enjoying it anyway. So I think that's, that for me, that's, yeah, that's a key one. Try, try and relax and enjoy it, and, uh, but be disciplined at the same time. Oh, that's really lovely. Catherine? That's really lovely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Catherine, um, what do you, Lynn, do you think across your yeah, I think, um I think maybe I've learned um, to be a bit more concise um, in terms of, um, yeah, just, just more concise just to make everything tighter because having gone through you know um a couple of structural edits now you kind of work out what is going to be trimmed um as you're writing so yeah just being a bit more concise I think is the main thing great thank you and do either of you have any advice for um wannabe or fledgling writers out there please jump in I would say yeah keep at it. Um, there's going to be setbacks um, and there always will be. I mean, I, I can remember when I had my first novel accepted, I thought, that's it, you know, cracked it. Um, yeah, it doesn't work like that. There's always going to be setbacks and I think you just need to keep on, keep on writing and keep on going and uh, um, keep your chin up and, and persevere with it. Excellent. Thank you. Catherine? Um, I would say um, be very careful about who you show your work to. Um, some people, uh, it, often people are very good at giving notes which are more about themselves or, you know, their preferences. I'd pick someone that you would take life advice from in real life and then ask them to read your book. Um, and and uh, in the same sort of vein, I'd say listen to editors. Editors know what works if they say cut a bit don't be precious, cut it. Um, you won't miss it. You won't even remember that character existed in a couple of months, um, unless it's the main character. Maybe rethink the whole story then, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that would be my advice. Brilliant. And finally, what's next? Catherine, you've got your, your New York story. Yes, yeah. Um, so the paperback of this is out tomorrow. Um, and then um, my... Uh, New York set um, Christmas story um, is out next uh, next winter um, and then uh, my TV show uh, starts filming um, in March and I think that will be on next Christmas on uh, on television so oh, fantastic congratulations and Simon uh, this is really embarrassing but I'm, I'm, I'm actually not going to say uh, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite superstitious about talking about anything before I, I feel, you know, it's, uh, it's nearly there, basically. Um, and how much of that is, is actual sort of not wanting to talk it away and how much is just wanting to give myself wiggle room in case I change my mind about something. <laughs> so uh, at this stage, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm working on the next novel, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to say what it is at the moment. So. What next is top secret. Um, <laughs> well, I wish you both well for tomorrow and the future and um, thank you so much for joining us this evening it's been a real pleasure to talk to you everybody huge round of applause for Catherine Steadman and Simon Beckett thank you thank you so much thank you and our other Simon B is going to join us now there he is and that's another show <laughs> gosh doesn't it fly that's great. Are you going to book your next holiday to the body farm? Oh, I thought you were going to say Bora Bora. Um, <laughs> probably not the body farm. <laughs> choices, choices. You know where you could go for a winter's break? Yeah. Whitley Bay. Got it in one. That's where it's all happening in February. <laughs> it's all happening all day, every day at the minute. You know, there's no well, time. No, particularly February the 12th, I think. Particularly February the 12th. <laughs> All the stops are coming out for February the 12th. Just to say that if anybody does want information about 
anything we've done on Baytales, really, um, you can always go to the Baytales website, www.baytales.com. Um, we will get a recording of this show up within the next 24, 48 hours, depending how cold my house is and whether we get a roof on. Um, and uh, you can also find a whole bunch of short stories submitted by authors, give you some inf inspiration if you fancy entering our Christmas competition. Um, and more information about how to buy tickets, lots of different ways you can get tickets for the February show, including emailing us direct um, if you have any questions or, or would like to ask us anything about the tickets themselves. Or if you'd like to save yourself some money. This is true. We are the, I don't know how to use the word cheap, because we're not cheap. I, I'm not cheap. I was going to say anyway, <laughs> um, we are inexpensive and you can save certain <laughs> online booking costs if you come directly to us at baytales20 at gmail.com. I used to be a salesperson, you know. He's got all the Polari, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so next month, shall I say what's happening Thunder next again. month? Christmas show? How is it? December again? <laughs> do we do a Christmas virtual noir at the bar show or a Christmas Baytales show? Put those ideas together, my friend. Mash them together. Why not? People seem to enjoy it so much last month. We'll be doing a Bay Tales um, virtual noir bar Christmas mashup next December. Keep an eye on our social media pages for more details on who will be appearing. And it could be you, as the saying goes, if you get your short story written and submitted. That's oh, me do. Go on. Go on. Send your short stories in. It'll be brilliant. Um, so it's left to me to say the really nice stuff, like thank you. To the lovely Simon B, Simon Beckett, Simon Buick. There's two of them. Double trouble to this one. Um, also, thank you to Catherine Stedman, Emily Edwards, Dan Stubbings, our musician, which as always is the wonderful Jason Isaacs. And thank you to you all for joining us tonight um, on this very chilly, but probably not as chilly as Simon Buick's house um, Wednesday night. Um, so we will hopefully see you for our VNAP B Bay Tales mashup in December on, let me check the date, Wednesday, the, drum roll please, I can hear them, you know, 15th of December. There'll be more information on our website very shortly, but don't forget, you've got the opportunity to win a free book. I think more information will be coming at the end of the show. So until next month, everybody, thank you and good night. <laughs>